Lost Planet 3 is an interesting game. Released 7 years ago back in 2013, it didn't have a great reception at launch, and at the time of recording this video it was the last game in the Lost Planet series. If you go off what you hear online, and haven't played the game yourself, you might just think of this instalment as the bad one, or the worst one. Is that justified? Well, sort of, but during my replay for this video I did end up coming to some conclusions I didn't expect to, and the preconceived opinion I had in my head didn't end up being entirely true. To explain why that was, we'll take a deep dive into the game and talk about its presentation, gameplay, and story. Before jumping in though, if you haven't watched the first two videos in this series, I'd suggest you do that now, because they give some good context to some of the things I'll be talking about. With that being said, let's take a look back at Lost Planet 3. When you boot up the game, you'll immediately see something that wasn't there in the past games, the logo of Spark Unlimited. While the previous games were solely developed by Capcom, this one was outsourced to Spark, which used to be a studio based in California. The fact that I've just said used to might already ring some alarm bells, as they went out of business two years after the release of Lost Planet 3. That's jumping ahead a bit though. Lost Planet 3 was the fourth game they developed. Their first and best received game was Call of Duty Finest Hour, which got a 73 on Metacritic. Next they did Legendary and Turning Point Fall of Liberty, both of which got a far more mediocre reception. I actually liked Legendary back in the day, because I liked Greek mythology, and at the time there wasn't a whole lot of games based around it, but it was definitely on the weaker side of the quality scale. Based on this alone, it might seem like a strange choice for Capcom to trust them with Lost Planet 3. However, Capcom always did want the Lost Planet series to appeal to Western audiences as well as those in their home market. While I looked back at Lost Planet 2 very fondly, at the time it wasn't well received and didn't reach Capcom's sales expectations. Keiji Inafune, executive producer of Lost Planet 2, specifically pointed to the game being too Japanese as a reason for the failure in sales. Couple this with the fact that Kenji Oguro, who created the Lost Planet series, wanted to make the third installment a more cinematic experience, Spark might have seemed like a good choice. Their office was right next to Hollywood after all, and so they had access to talent who'd have worked in and around the film industry. This is probably what helped them nail one aspect of the presentation, the look and feel of EDN3. This is really the only game where I actually felt like the planet was as cold and as dangerous as it should be. The landscapes look great, and in the distance you can see these big structures made of ice and snow. There's harsh storms that appear every now and again too, which make it feel like the planet is working against you. Unfortunately though, a lot of the areas you'll actually be moving through aren't as interesting as what you can see off in the distance. Large areas like the snowy plain feel very empty and flat, somehow more so than what was in the first game. This game is semi-open world in that it's made up of several medium to large areas connected at the edges. You can move between these areas at any time while not on a mission, which in theory sounds great for exploration. However, you probably won't want to do this because most of the time your missions will have you backtracking through the same areas over and over again. I wonder if the reason a lot of the areas are so flat and boring is because they needed to fit multiple missions into each area, and so they didn't want to make something a bit more special that could only work once. This is a huge because the environments have always been a highlight in past games. I'm guessing the reason they ended up this way was to accommodate for the new style of gameplay. Lost Planet 3 is a third person shooter and that's about it. Pretty much every aspect that made the game interesting is gone, and this is especially obvious when we're talking about the mobility. Lost Planet has always let you be extremely flexible with the way you move around. You could grapple onto pretty much every surface, and levels were designed with this in mind. In Lost Planet 3 however, you can't even jump. Being permanently stuck to the ground this way reduces what we the player can choose to do, and from a developer standpoint, it reduces how you can design your levels, because you have to accommodate for this. A good example of this is right at the start of the game, where I was trying to figure out how to jump over this tiny ledge, before realising the game wanted me to use this tunnel to my right. This railroading is never fun, especially when it's so obvious. The grappling hook can also only be used when the game wants you to, so it might as well not be there. You can still roll to dodge attacks, but it feels really strange. If you time it right for some attacks, you'll do a different animation that you weren't expecting, like this sidestep. Sometimes you'll dive through the air and be invincible the whole time. Barring these two though, you'll do a standard roll, which feels pretty useless because half the time you'll get hit afterwards anyway. The other way of avoiding damage is to use cover. That's right, for some reason this game has a Gears of War style cover system, where you can snap to objects and hide behind them. This is such a weird thing to include because the vast majority of enemies attack by jogging up and smacking you in the face. Human enemies don't turn up 
until the very end of the game. And sure, it works fine for them, but it's baffling to me to include a whole system that only really gets used in the last hour and a half. To be fair, there's these Acrid that use cover too, and it's kind of cool to have a more sneaky Acrid for a change, but it doesn't really justify having this included. The weapons you'll be using are also such a downgrade from what was on offer previously. Seeing as this game is a prequel, they decided to bring down the technology available and keep things more grounded. While this works from an artistic standpoint, it doesn't translate into being fun for the player. In addition to this, the way you're given these weapons is very different. I'm mashing games 1 and 2 together a bit for this next statement, but essentially you used to choose what to start each mission with, and then throughout that level you'd find loads and loads of different weapons, and you'd probably use an average of 4 to 6 different weapons in each level. In Lost Planet 3, however, you pick what two weapons you'll take from a storage locker, and then probably use those same very weapons until the next time you find a storage locker. There's still some weapons scattered around, but at a far reduced rate, and you're more likely to find something when the devs felt it was time to unlock something new. This means you have way more time to get bored of the weapons that the game does offer to you. These weapons can be upgraded by spending thermal energy, that's right, thermal energy was downgraded from a gameplay mechanic to a simple currency. It's never been a mechanic that fully lived up to its potential, and perhaps it would be better placed in a slower paced game, but to see it effectively removed completely is a real shame. The upgrades you do get aren't really worthwhile either. Sure it's nice to have some more ammo or less recoil, but it doesn't provide enough motivation to really try hard at collecting the stuff. There's also far reduced feedback for when you do collect the energy. The pools on the floor after you kill Acrid are a lot smaller and duller than they used to be, and outside of a small noise effect you might not even notice you've picked it up a lot of the time. This is because when you're far away from your rig, your HUD disappears completely. The distance for this to happen is tiny, so it's how you'll be playing most of the game, and collecting thermal energy is a lot more boring when there's no visual feedback for it. This removal of the HUD was done to help build the atmosphere and immersion of the game, and usually I'd appreciate the choice. Games like Dead Space did a great job of this by including all the information provided by a HUD into the main character's suit and weapon. In Lost Planet 2 however, you don't get any information conveyed to you at all. I can see how much ammo I have left before I'll need to reload, but have no idea how much ammo I have in total. Likewise, I have no idea what my health is, so I can't figure out what attacks are weak and which are strong. Being this restrictive with what information you tell the player would work better in a survival horror game, not an action game like Lost Planet. The last big elephant in the room is the VS's, or rather, the lack thereof. Because this game is a prequel, the mechs haven't been invented yet, so instead we get to use a large utility rig, which fills the same sort of space but was designed for mining instead of combat. Because of this, there's no guns attached to the thing, and instead you'll be fighting Acrid hand to hand and reappropriating mining tools into makeshift weapons. There are aspects of this that I think are pretty cool. For example, being in first person helps add to the atmosphere a bit. The fights with larger enemies, however, often devolve into scripted quick time events and actions. Standing still and waiting for these QTEs to trigger is pretty boring, and using the drill to damage Acrid weak spots isn't as satisfying as it should be because it just feels so meek. Speaking of Acrid, they're in a pretty sorry state. Their designs look a lot more bland, and their variety is far reduced from what was on offer in past installments. The bosses are also pretty bad. What was the highlight of Lost Planet 2 becomes one of the more boring parts of this game when you have to fight the same crab bosses over and over again. I do like that you fight Acrid more than you fight humans this time around though, but it would have been nice to see a lot more variety. It's probably also a good time to mention that there's no co-op. When playing the game this makes a lot of sense. It really just wouldn't fit with the cinematic and atmospheric take they were going for. It's also told exclusively from the perspective of Jim Payton, a down-to-earth guy who's travelled to EDN3 to make some good money through hard work to provide for his family back on Earth. We're given a lot more detail on the setting and world of the games than ever before thanks to the renewed focus on narrative and story. As mentioned earlier, this game is a prequel, which allowed some opportunities to delve into some of the other plot points in past games that didn't previously receive that much attention. We learned, for example, that Earth is facing an energy crisis, causing widespread unrest and an altogether shitty time for everyone. Thermal energy is being hailed by Navik as a potential miracle solution to the crisis, and it's Jim's new job to mine it. The game starts, however, with an old Jim being mortally wounded, and telling his life story to his granddaughter before he dies. At this point we know nothing about either of these characters though, so we can't really feel all that sad about what's happening, and we also have no tension throughout the game's events, because we know that Jim survives up to this point, and we know that his family is going to join him on EDN3. We return to this time frame every now and again, usually at the end of each story act. 
Jim spends the first few months getting settled into his new job and getting to know his colleagues. These are all better defined characters than what we've seen in the past, even if their traits are a little bit overblown sometimes. Any answer, and I do mean any answer, can be dissected into being. Any secret can be cut open when the scalpel is sharp enough. This is science, right? 80% uh, patience and 20% is cutting things open. <laughs> Until next time, mother. In these early days, Jim notices something strange, in that he keeps seeing somebody in the distance. At this point, everyone believes they are the only people on the planet, so it's chalked up to a psychological effect of the tough environment. Later on, however, Jim comes across an abandoned Nevik base, confirming that in the past there were indeed other people living on the planet, and their crew is not the first. Digging through the base, he figures out that it was Acrid that killed the inhabitants. But before he can get the info back to his crew, he's ambushed by a catchy acrid and knocked down a cliff. Luckily, the person he saw from a distance isn't a figment of his imagination. Instead, it's a woman named Mira, who rescues and heals him up using thermal energy in the method that will eventually give rise to the Harmonizers. She's from a group who call themselves the Forgotten, and they're the survivors from Nevik's first colonization effort. They're led by a man named Soichi, Mira's father, who agrees to let Jim leave as long as he doesn't reveal to his crew that they exist. On the way back, he finds the home base in a mess and under attack by Acrid, thanks to the efforts of Dr. Kovac, who is researching ways of controlling them. After clearing out the Acrid and destroying the technology that Kovac was using to rile up the Acrid, Jim confronts the operation leader Braddock about the old base he found. Braddock reveals that he did know about the first colony, and even that his father was the one who led it. However, due to the disastrous results, it appears Nevik wants it forgotten, and will pull the funding from their current project if the truth is revealed. Wanting to understand this whole story better, Jim searches for information with the help of the Forgotten, and eventually does find some answers. It's revealed that Braddock was actually born on EDN3, a fact he didn't know about, and that his father abandoned the colony to its fate in order to save his son. He understandably feels pretty shitty about this, and Jim nearly tells him about the survivors, but gets cut short by Acred. There's a bit of a time jump, and we see that Jim is spending more and more time with the Forgotten, even referring to them as his people. We also learn of the existence of Nushi, a large Acred that is the source of pure thermal energy. Shortly after learning this, Jim returns to base and finds that Nevik has taken over the operation from Braddock, and they're looking for the scientist, Dr. Roman. She's been researching this pure thermal energy and has figured out the location of Nushi. Jim arrives too late to warn her, however, and finds she's been murdered, and, in his anger, he kills a nearby Nevik soldier. This action is Jim's point of no return, and he devises a plan with the Forgotten and Gale to sabotage Nevik's operation and kick them off the planet. While they're doing this, however, the Forgotten are attacked by Nevik. Jim rushes to help them, but Soichi is killed by Nevik's leader, Eisenberg, who's the father of the first game's Eisenberg. Eisenberg threatens Jim by revealing that Nevik has his family, and so he gives himself up and is interrogated, revealing to him the location of Nushi. To make up for the actions of his father, Braddock helps Jim escape and lures most of the Nevik soldiers onto the ship functioning as their base, before sacrificing himself by destroying it. While this does remove most of Nevik from the equation, it's also just destroyed their one way off the planet, and with it Jim's hopes of seeing his family again are lost. But then immediately his wife turns up and it's fine. It turns out Pradik somehow wrangled them away from Nevik, probably before everything kicked off. The happy reunion is cut short though, when Dr. Kovac returns and informs the squad that Eisenberg has taken his acrid controlling tech and is headed off for Nushi. Jim sets out after him and travels through Nushi to find Eisenberg setting up at the creature's heart. He's in his VS, which has paragraphs of text flying around for some reason, and is intending to use Nushi to kill the rebels and be a source of pure thermal energy. They brawl it out and Eisenberg is killed, with Jim losing a leg in the process. After that, things went well for the crew for a while, before rival factions like Crimson Unity appeared and Nevik eventually made a return. In the present day, Jim apologises to his granddaughter for leaving her a world in which she'll have to fight, before finally passing away. After mourning, Jim's granddaughter Diana sets out with a plan to fight Nevik and win back control of the planet. Given that she's never mentioned by Wayne or Gale in Lost Planet 1, we have to assume it wasn't a very good plan. 
The story is a lot more engaging at points than previous games, but the pacing is really poor. It can feel like hours go by with nothing happening, followed by small bursts of high intensity plot developments. This is especially true of the end, where everything escalates so quickly. Like I mentioned earlier, the characters here are pretty decent. Between loading screens we often see them sending video messages or archive footage, which is a good way to sneak in some extra development. Their animations are also pretty good for the most part and help elevate some of the scenes, like in the moment where Jim is deciding whether to tell Braddock about the first colony survivors in order to soothe his guilt. At the times it's not so great though. Jim almost looks excited in a very troubling way when he's watching these videos of the first colony survivors being killed by Acrid. Overall, the narrative is the strongest aspect of the game, completely reversing what was true in the first two installments. Before wrapping things up, I want to quickly talk about some final random things that I think should be mentioned. First of all, there is a multiplayer mode that I haven't covered at all. The past two games are stuck with the curse of games for Windows live, which makes the multiplayer almost unplayable nowadays. But Lost Planet 3 actually seemingly has everything still up and running. Back in the day, people generally had fun with the multiplayer mode, but because of the tiny player base nowadays, you'll probably have to organise a game yourself to check it out. Throughout this video, you might have noticed the cutscenes are a lot worse looking than the gameplay portions. You can fix this by downloading the high res movie DLC from Steam, which is free. I only realised this after finishing the game, so do yourself a favour and learn from my mistake. There's also way more glitches and bugs than past games, and some really strange things hard baked into the game itself. Like look at this for example, the game tells me I need to press W, A, S or D to rotate this valve. So what key do you press? Well, the answer is obviously F, and none of the other keys do anything. To be clear, I haven't changed any key bindings, and this happens in the first hour of the game and stays the same throughout. I guess this was a developer and testing oversight, and makes me think that there might be worse glitches or bugs that I just didn't run into. Throughout all of this, you might have noticed I've been comparing a lot of Lost Planet 3 to the previous games which you might think is a bit unfair. I've been doing this because I think it's an easy way to explain and show what the problems are, especially if you yourself have played these games. To be fair, I don't think a sequel has to follow the same formula as previous titles either, but I do think they should at least carry some of the themes and mechanics. For example, let's look at Resident Evil 7. Switching to entirely first person was a huge change for the series, but it managed to tweak and reinvent a lot of the same mechanics and themes that people enjoy in Resident Evil games. In Lost Planet 3, mechanics and reimagined and were instead just removed. Thermal energy going from a gameplay mechanic to a currency, your grappling hook being completely neutered, and even co-op if you felt Lost Planet 2 was a step in the right direction. Let's forget the name of the game for a minute and call it something completely different. If this released on its own in a universe without the first two Lost Planet games, it would have probably been better received. I don't think it would have gotten a great reception, because it still has a lot of problems, but without the expectation that comes with a 3 in the title, it's a lot easier to forgive or even not notice some of these poorer aspects. But these expectations did exist in the real world, and probably contributed to the dismal sales results at release. Lost Planet 3 sold only 27.5 thousand copies on the PS3 in Japan during the first week, which was the worst debut of the series, and that pretty much spelled the end of Lost Planet. Spark Unlimited went on to make one last game, Yaiba Ninja Gaiden Z, before finally going bust in 2015. Capcom changed their strategy and stopped outsourcing their IPs to other studios, preferring to focus on developing them at home in Japan instead. So is there any hope for a new Lost Planet game? I don't have a definite answer for that, but we can look at the evidence in front of us. First of all, there's not been any attention paid to the series in over 7 years, which isn't a great sign. That being said, Capcom has been doing a great job in recent years of reinvigorating old franchises. Resident Evil 7 got a great reception after a mediocre sixth instalment, and Monster Hunter World was the first game in the Monster Hunter series to see great sales success in the West. Seeing as Capcom always wanted Lost Planet to be an IP with great sales in the West, who knows if the success of Monster Hunter might encourage them to try something with Lost Planet again. In the meantime though, we still have three games you can always look back on. The series saw highs and lows, and each instalment brought something drastically different from the one coming before it. I hope you've enjoyed taking a look back with me during these videos, and if you do decide to replay them yourself, I'd love to hear what you thought of them. I have some ideas of what games I want to cover next, so please subscribe for more future content like this. In the meantime, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.